Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to open what I know will be a dynamic conversation today with the leaders of the California public higher education system. Let's give them a round of applause. My name is Edward Bush, and I am the president of Cosumnes River College. Yes, we always would pause for that. Yeah, absolutely. A founding member of AMEN and a proud member of the board of directors for the campaign for college oppor opportunity. I am additionally excited to be here today as this evening officially marks the second event under the campaign's 20th anniversary celebration. Let's, let's clap for that as well. 20 years of tremendous work and effort from the campaign. I've been proud to serve on the board of an organization that has pushed transformative change within California higher education. Over the last 20 years, they have been on the forefront of transforming transfer and making transfer level course placement more equitable for community college students. They have spearheaded efforts to remove discriminatory standardized testing requirements for admissions to out of state, to our state universities, have tirelessly worked towards equal opportunity to college uh, amid challenges to race conscious admissions in California and nationwide and more. Part of what makes the campaign so special is their ability to, re to convene higher education leaders, advocates, students, and legislators to dialogue to hear their priorities and to advance racial and ethnic equity in higher education. This is the second time the campaign is gathering the system leaders of the University of California, the California State University, and the California Community Colleges. And this is a moment to celebrate 20 years ago, these leaders were three white men. Today, we have all three leaders of color and two being women. What a difference two decades would make. The campaign has long advocated for the change that we see today. For a moment when students can look at their leaders on campus and within their system to see themselves reflected. By combining research and policy advocacy, the campaign has been committed to uncovering the disparities, highlighting the progress and acting for a better future for students for two decades. Today, you will hear highlights from their latest publication, Still Left Out, how exclusion in California colleges and university continues to hurt our values, students, and democracy. This reexamines the issue of representation in leadership across California's public colleges and universities, which they first examined five years ago under their watershed report, Left Out. We all know that California boasts a world-class public higher education system. The California Community Colleges, the California State University, and the University of California are engines of opportunity that power the state forward. We also know that California and our higher education systems are incredibly diverse. Today, Latinx, Black, Asian American, Native, Hawa uh, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and American Indian, Alaskan Native Californians account for 61% of our state population and 67% of our undergraduate student body. And this share is projected to grow, and that is worthy of a round of applause as well. And yet, and yet, while diversity is our greatest asset, the representation of racially and ethnically minoritized faculty 
in California colleges and university is woefully low. Despite the important strides our systems have made to ensure the full inclusion and success of diverse racial and ethnic groups, they still continue to privilege and prioritize whiteness among college leadership. Why is this important? Well, I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> By not investing in improved representation in the efforts to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, we send a signal to California's residents, students, and scholars about who belongs in higher education and who can contribute to our society. California has a vision to achieve. We need governing board members to share the lived experiences of students so they can make the best decision towards their success. We need more faculty of minoritized backgrounds that can apply culturally relevant curriculum in our increasingly multicultural world. Our state is stronger and our people are better served when we include Californians of all racial, ethnic backgrounds in our higher education institutions. Before we begin this conversation, we'd like to thank our event sponsors who are making this evening possible. Thank you to the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Give it up for Michelson. the Los Rios Community College District, <laughs> Sacramento State University. I don't know how I feel about that applause being louder than Los Rios. It makes me want to go back. And since I have the mic, I will. Los Rios Community College District. I appreciate it. Thank you for indulging me. And the Precision Task Group. Please. Now, please join me in welcoming Myra Lowenbrew, Chief Operating Officer of the Michelson 20MM Foundation, who will share a few remarks. Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you all on this sunny, bright day. Um, I, I'm Myra Lombera. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Michelson 20MM Foundation, and it's truly my honor to be here to represent the organization. Uh, a little bit about the foundation. The foundation was founded in 2010 by Dr. Gary Michelson and his wife, Alia Michelson, as the 20 Million Minds Foundation, which represented the total number of students in higher education at that time. Um, we've been called 20 millimeters, it's 20 million minds. Um, it's a mouthful, so we shortened it to 20MM some years ago when we rebranded, but um, we still are, are focused on representing, uh, representing the, the students in post-secondary education in, its to in their totality. Um, at that time, we had one express commitment to address the textbook affordability crisis. Edward, you're tall. Uh, the textbook affordability crisis that was hindering the success of talented and promising community college students that were simply unable to afford the textbooks they needed to pass their courses. Now, while we wanted to drive down the cost of textbooks as a whole, we were predominantly focused on STEM courses where a textbook was often more expensive than the course itself. To put it in perspective, in 2010 when the foundation was formed, a three-unit course at a community college was $78, and yet a new Campbell's Introduction to Biology textbook was costing students up to $335. Now, this was a significant financial burden for students, and we were hearing it time after time. So when our, our benefactor, Dr. Michelson, learned of the caring and committed faculty, give it up for faculty, please. 
these faculty were pulling resources, their own dollars, and fundraising to launch scholarships and textbook loan programs to help students from racially minoritized groups be able to afford their textbooks, especially those that were pursuing degrees in STEM fields. Um, and so Dr. Michelson was moved to action. He knew this wasn't sustainable and we needed to do more. So he tasked the 20MM team to identify a long-term sustainable solution that could drive down the cost of textbooks in the marketplace indefinitely. Big challenge. And that led to the foundation's first investment alongside three other foundations in a nonprofit publisher called OpenStax College at the time. Now OpenStax publishes textbooks even for K-12 today. That ended up producing publisher grade textbooks and ancillary materials in the highest enrollment courses across community colleges and now even in AP courses in our K-12 system. And fast forward almost 14 years later, OpenStax now has an impressive catalog of 65 textbooks. They've saved students over $2.9 billion and had, I'll pause for that. And they've touched the lives of 36 million students and will continue to touch the lives of many more students. I share this textbook and mater uh, materials affordability issue because it's just one of several challenges that minoritized students were and still continue to face alongside um, our, our institutions today. And while we thought we had addressed the issue of textbook affordability, we're seeing it now morph into a different model called inclusive access, taking right our language, the language of our community, publishers are taking the language of our communities to galvanize individuals into actions, action and, 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 but really under a false pretense. And while when the foundation was first formed, we were solely focused on textbook affordability and we continue to be, um, we've now expanded into other issue areas as well, um, including student basic needs, digital equity, intellectual property education, um, and, and a, a range of, of other um, issues that our students are facing. Um, I wanna highlight that this issue also brings to light the fact that we have other challenges like mentorship, representation, sentiments of otherness, and isolation that our students are experiencing in academia and continue to hinder the success of all of them. And it's precisely for those reasons that the research that the campaign has put forward and is spotlighting today is critical. Philanthropy will continue to play a crucial role in advancing college access and success for minoritized students. Their collective support can and has had a significant impact on breaking down barriers, publishing much needed research, and creating opportunities for students to succeed. But it's organizations like the campaign and those that are on the ground that we're proud to count ourselves as allies and supporters of. We wanna make sure that these types of advocates that are working to advance racial equity agendas fiercely continue to be able to do so and are well resourced, so thank you. Thank you, Myra. Rain or shine, <laughs> the Campaign for College Opportunity is gonna fight for students. I'm Michelle Siqueiros. For 20 years, I have been incredibly proud to be working on behalf of students, on behalf of a stronger California, uh, as the president of the Campaign for College Opportunity, and I'm so excited to have you all join me in what is a historic first a first public forum with the president of the University of California, the chancellor of the California Community College System, and the chancellor of the Cal State University System, each of whom are people that I admire, respect, who have trailblazed and uh, carried that title of first, first African-American president of the UC, first woman, first Asian American chancellor of the California Community College System, first Latina CSU president ever, and first Latina Cal State University chancellor. What an honor to have you all here together to show us um, not just how amazing the first are, 
but how we got to make sure that the second, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths all follow. So thank you. Thank you. Hot off the presses is still left out. If it feels warm, it's because the staff literally picked it out, uh, picked it up from uh, the printers essentially uh, less than an hour ago. If the, you know, if it's leaking, you know, just be careful. But you know, part of how we have been successful in championing a student-centered agenda is to use research and data and to share that research and data with you. Um, so that policymakers, staff, um, leaders can focus on um, using information to inform the kind of change that we know puts students first. And we're excited. This was a historic report in 2018 that for the first time ever documented the racial, ethnic, and gender composition of every uh, system-wide office campus, leadership, faculty, and academic senate bodies. And if you're asking why, it's because we know that who is at the table makes important decisions that affect students and the future of California. We also know that students deserve to be able to see themselves amongst their leaders, and that all women who make up the majority of college students in California deserve to see women in every single table and position of power and deserve to be taught by folks that share a common experience and they deserve to be taught by people that don't so we can continue to thrive in a multiracial democracy. Having a Latino faculty wasn't just important for me as the first in my family to go to college as a Latina. It was important for me to have black faculty, Asian American faculty, white faculty, women, men, LGBTQ members of our community, trans, so that we could thrive as a society and be able to coalesce and really find the kinds of solutions that we know matter. But I'm not going to share this report because we called in the real experts. But before I do that, I just want to thank Dr. Vakash Reddy in the back corner over there, standing sharp in his three-piece suit, who was the lead author on this report. And I also really want to thank Dr. Luke Wood, your amazing Sac State president. But I get to claim him first because he was on my board before that. And um, also the author of a companion piece to this report with Dr. Frank Harris called Equity-Minded Hiring Practices. So when we look at these um, problems, we want to present you with solutions. Thank you, Dr. Wood. I don't know how you lead campus and still find time to do the important research that you do. And we are so super grateful that you do. Um, I also see that Ben Cheetah is here and just want to thank you. In the midst of an incredible uh, budget deficit and challenge, we know that Ben is there advocating for students and for higher education, and we are super grateful for your leadership. Thank you, Ben. Um, I get to call up our student leaders. Um, and I want you to, to meet Casey Chang from the California Community Colleges. And I want to all, I call you all three up. Um, Casey's going to go first, but Autumn Alanis Wiggins from the California State University and Carlos Rodriguez from the University of California. They are each going to present some of the findings in this report um, directly to you. Thank you for your leadership, for your scholarship, for your time uh, joining us today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, college leaders, practitioners, students, and community members from across the state here with us today. My name is Casey Chang, and I'm a student at Mission College. I'm also the newly appointed student member to the California Community College's Board of Governors. Where I advocate for 1.8 million students across 116 colleges around the state of California. As an active student member, I'm encouraged by the potential of our community colleges. In the largest and most diverse system of higher education in this country, 
14% of our students identify as Asian American, N Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders, nearly mirroring 15% of Asian American and NHPI uh, residents across the state. The great news comes with a few caveats. Being surrounded by Asian American communities in the Bay Area, you'd expect Mission College faculty and leadership to reflect the diversity of our students. However, I've often found a disheartening lack of representation while going to school, particularly as a STEM major. While I've had a few professors who are Asian American men, navigating higher education as a woman of color has been difficult. As I have yet to take a class with a female Asian American professor, and it feels like my identity has been left out. Additionally, it's discouraging to witness the representation imbalance serving on campus and district positions. I was one of the only Asian Americans invited to the decision making table. California community colleges made important strides in the last five years with more Latinx, Black, Asian American, and NHPI leaders serving on the Board of Governors, on the Academic Senate, Chancellor's Office, District Trustees, and more. But since 2017, a majority of leaders have, are, were white, compared to an overwhelmingly Latinx, Black, Asian American, and Native Hawaiian student population. In 2017, 60% or more of the college's non-tenured faculty, tenured faculty, senior leadership, and district trustees were white. Additionally, over 70% of the board and statewide academic senates were also white. That same year, Latinx students represented 44% of the student body and no college leadership group had more than 19% representation by Latinx leaders. We have seen some important improvements in the last five years. The percentage of black members on the Board of Governors has more than doubled from 12% in 2017 to 25% in 2021. The same is true for Latinx members on the board. In 2017, Asian Americans had no representation on both the Board of Governors and the statewide Academic Senate. After five years, Asian American diversity increased to 8% on the board and 7% on the Academic Senate. The bad news is that racial and ethnic diversity of non-tenured faculty has remained virtually unchanged from 2017 to 2021. One improvement is the percentage of Latinx non-tenure faculty growing from 13 to 23%. It's important to remember that even with this growth, these numbers don't reflect the diverse body of students. Encouragingly, we are seeing greater representation of women on almost every level of leadership in the colleges. In 2017, fewer than half of the Board of Governors members, district leadership, and statewide academic senate representatives were women. Women now make up over 50% of the college's student body and are well represented at all levels of leadership and faculty. I think a lot about the impact of leadership has on diversity, um, has on students feeling welcome and being able to thrive on campus. I recognize that while I can't represent all students, my passion for creating a more student-centered system will foster a better experience for every community college student. I am inspired by my own college's president, Dr. Sahara Wan, who has been an exceptional mentor who has always empowered students. Her selfless leadership has built a culture at Mission College that centers around student voices, leads faculty through transformative changes, and maintains focus on core principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. We need more of this at our community colleges. Leaders like President Awan and our esteemed chancellor, Sonia Christian, who is here with us today, who hold key positions while using their platforms to center equity and promote diversity. Not every community college student has been supported the way that I have. But that's what keeps me going. It's not simply being committed to equity. We need that professor, that president, that administrator to reach us in culturally affirming ways. All we hope for is to be shown that we're welcome and belong at the college that we choose and that we're a part of a community and not just another statistic. Everyone here today has a role to play in making that happen across California higher education. The numbers paint a stark picture. 
without diverse faculty and leadership who hold shared backgrounds with our diverse college campuses, we're hindering the equitable success of two thirds of our community college students. Thank you. iPad doesn't want to work right now. One second. Okay. What an amazing speech. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Autumn Alanis Wiggins, and I serve as the student body president for Chico State. Yeah. Go Wildcats. As an Afro-Indigenous, Hispanic, and first-generation student, I have worked to uplift and empower student voices in universities and system-wide committees. Despite the many opportunities that I have in the open doors, the reality is I'm still being left out. My story in higher education actually begins at Camp Mendocino, which was part of the Boys and Girls Club of San Francisco in 2018, where I worked as a garden program specialist um, for underprivileged youth. I built a modest garden program into a culturally responsive educational platform with transformative topics of food justice, nutritional access, and yes, how to plant a potato. <laughs> Cultural richness within nutrition pushed me to pursue nutritional communication at Chico State. However, I was, excited to, I was excited to feel empowered studying nutrition, but as I started my classes, I uncovered a program that was not quite culturally responsive teaching about the benefits of kale and quinoa rather than the intersectionalities of systemic racism with food swamps and nutritional inequities impacting students like the children I worked with at Camp Medicino. It quickly became clear to me that the absence of diverse identities in faculty and leadership positions hinder us from equitable student access, causing ripple effects in holistic advocacy to address diverse student needs. This is not an issue affecting just my campus but one that is prevalent across the entire California State University system. Today, enrollment in the CSU is incredibly diverse, with nearly 70% of our student body identifying as Latinx, Black, Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. However, leadership and faculty are still overwhelmingly white. In 2017, the CSU Academic Senate was 83% white, and over 60% of tenured faculty are white. Yet black faculty are only 4%, and Latinx faculty only make up 10%, despite Latinx students making up 43% of the student body. When we look at today, not much has changed. As you can see in the span of five years, the CSU representation across the board is still sorely lacking in racial and ethnic diversity. The representation of black and Latinx faculty has not changed since 2017. Senior leadership has improved. While some important gains have been made for Latinx and black representatives on the statewide academic senate, it is not nearly at adequate enough levels to make systemic changes that reflect our students. In my work as a leader, I have noted misguided efforts to enact that systemic change. Transformative stories and ideas made to empower and uplift diversity are watered down landing on the backs of tokenized black and brown faculty to follow through. The data clearly shows we are not doing nearly enough to combat decades of inequities and representation across the CSU system. Strategic methods and targeted practices to recruit and most importantly retain diverse faculty and administrators must be a priority. For myself, a lack of belonging coupled with affordability issues, took a toll on my mental health, and I decided to leave college for over a year. When I returned, I met an incredible professor, Dr. Seth Cloboto, who was the new and the first black faculty member I had had at Chico State. He taught culturally relevant courses and even hired me as a research assistant, where I became published through a study on nutritional knowledge in EOP students. For the first time, I was getting the support that I needed from the start. I longed for more beyond Dr. Cloboto's unique support, so I switched majors to multicultural gender studies and sociology, where I experienced a different realm of student success. The diversity of professors and the care that they brought to instruction made it feel much more 
safe and took care of my well-being. The support inspired me to run for Director of Social Justice and Equity, which has brought me here before you today. Now, I represent over 14,000 students as AS president and nearly half a million students through CSSA. I have worked diligently to pave my path and find my sense of belonging through college, and I could not have done it without the support of professors that reflected the same experiences that I had in the classes they teach. Now, let us take a moment to address the elephant in the room. Faculty across the CSU are going on strike next week, which will leave some classrooms empty, some closed. Student academic experiences might come to a halt. We, might, we must grapple with the reality that employees and students of color who often come from first generation or come from under-resourced backgrounds will disproportionately shoulder the burden. For the sake of students and the future of California, we must remind ourselves why the CSU system exists, the People University, to educate the new majority of America. We need that majority reflected in our faculty and our educators to pay them what they are worth. Let's make faculty diversity a core priority in our work to advance student success and close equity gaps. Policymakers and system leaders alike can and should do more in being intentional at directing campus presidents and academic senate leaders towards improving the experiences of faculty, staff, and students. We must invest in strengthening diverse and equitable admissions, hiring, and retention practices so that people who look like me are no longer systemically left out. To our new Chancellor Garcia, the first Latina to lead our system, thank you for being here. As our communities face many challenges, we look to you and leaders in the CSU across higher ed to remain optimistic while we take bold action. We know you are up for the task ahead of us. I leave you with a quote from James Baldwin. Not everything faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Rodriguez, and I'd like to begin by saying that I am many things. I'm the first in my family to graduate high school, a graduate of Portable College, the son of Mexican immigrants, and a system-impacted first-year transfer studying economics at one of California's most selective institutions, UCLA. As a first-generation college student, I am so excited to be in, Washington, in the Washington, D.C. program for the winter quarter, interning with my hometown congressman, David Valadeo, and having opportunities like this to be in both our state and national capitals, speaking to important people like you all. My call to higher education and student leadership has always been to humanize the college experience, to make it feel like less of a machine so that California fully supports the students it's intended to serve. My goals have always been to help out students like me who didn't have support early on to see college as a legitimate option for them. Five years ago, I was a freshman in high school and I believe college was out of reach for me because I didn't have anybody advising me who came from similar backgrounds and I was almost left out. I've made it this far thanks to a strong support network that will live in my heart forever. While I was at Porterville, it was my custodial colleagues who had never ceased to cheer me on and who advised me professionally and personally, even though it wasn't in their job description. I've made it this far to support, or sorry. It was my community college calculus professor, Miguel Ruelas, a UCLA, a UCLA alum, who walked me through the transfer process and made me feel welcomed at Porterville. He had the reputation of being invested in his students, and I experienced that firsthand. He's a first generation college grad like myself, and from a working class family, coming from a background very much like mine, with the same challenges related to money and experience navigating the college maze. He went above and beyond what was expected, and I would spend at least 10 hours a week with him, either in class or working with him during and after office hours to make transfer possible for me. 
He helped me envision what my life at UCLA and beyond would look like, which wasn't something anyone in my family could do, no matter how much they loved and supported me. And today, it's my transfer peer advisors who are guiding my UCLA experience. I've been at UCLA for one quarter now, and I still have many questions and challenges as a first generation transfer student trying to navigate an elite space, which is a large departure from my experience at Portable College. I came from a system where 46% of students are Latinx to a system where only 25% of students are Latinx and even less at more selective campuses. The UC system does have a diverse student body, however. Over 60% of the UC student body is Latinx, Black, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, though it hasn't changed much in the last five years. Despite the rich diversity of the UC student body, similar to the California Community College and CSU systems, UC's leadership and faculty is overwhelmingly white. In 2017, 70% of tenured faculty and campus leadership was white and 82% of the UC Academic Senate was white. And in five years, with the exception of the representation on the UC Board of Regents, every category of leadership, from tenured and non-tenured faculty, statewide Academic Senate, and campus senior leadership remain at least 50% white. Latinx professors represent only 8% or less of faculty, despite being 25% of the UC student population and more than half of all K through 12 students in the state of California. The UC Board of Regents is by far the most racially and ethnically diverse leadership body within the UC, where over half the regents are either Latinx, Black, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander. What I have found is that leaders who come from, a sh from shared backgrounds or who look like you can break through the cold exterior of higher education. With diverse leaders, students are more likely to find someone who can answer their financial aid questions, who can guide them through selecting classes, and who can ensure students are on the, wo on, on the road to a timely graduation, all without judgment because they have trudged the path before. Education becomes more accessible to those with diverse backgrounds when people from those same backgrounds are assisting the newer generations. I'm still very new at UCLA, and I'm hopeful to build a community here, but this process can be made easier with a coordinated system-wide effort to diversify UC leadership. Situated in the heart of Los Angeles, it's disheartening to see that neither the students nor leaders reflect California's rich diversity. You have the data, the research, and all the information you need to take action. Five years later, one thing is clear. Black, Latinx, and underrepresented Asian American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander Californians are still left out, limiting our potential to strengthen our state's future. Thank you for your time. How about another round of applause for our students? Very impressive. As our panelists take their seats, let me say good evening. Thank you for joining us for this vital discussion about educational disparities and more importantly, how California, three systems of higher education are working together to close these gaps. My name is Dr. Juan Munoz and I serve as Chancellor of the University of California Merced and also serve on the board of directors of the Campaign for College Opportunity. Uh, tonight's subject, is a great uh, personal significance for me uh, as uh, I find myself having moved through these systems at various points, uh, both holding the degrees in uh, UC and CSU. I was a community college instructor at East LA College, advisor at West LA College. All right, all right now, all right, okay. And uh, assistant professor at Cal State Fullerton. Go Titans, let's go, all right. And now I have the privilege to serve as professor and chancellor at UC Merced. And I might say 80% of our students are students of color and 99% of whom are from California. Thank you. One higher education leader, very familiar to our student population in the Valley, is a longtime partner in the San Joaquin Valley and now the 10th Chancellor of California Community College with 116 campuses and more than 1.9 million students. Dr. Sonia Christian was named, was named Chancellor in 2023, building on a long record of success at colleges in Bakersfield and in Oregon and as an academic leader, as a professor of mathematics. 
and also she holds a PhD from UCLA, my alma mater. We also are joined uh, in our panel by Dr. Mildred Garcia, named recently the 11th Chancellor of the California State System. The CSU has 23 campuses and nearly half a million uh, students. Dr. Garcia held academic and administrative appointments at colleges across the United States, including uh, presidencies at Dominguez Hills and Cal State Fullerton, and holds her EDD from Columbia University. And finally, President Michael Drake, who was named the 21st leader of the University of California in 2020. The UC has 10 campuses, six academic health centers, hopefully soon seven, and uh, <laughs> plug, 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 three affiliate national laboratories and nearly 300,000 students. Former president of the Ohio State University, Dr. Drake holds, you have, you've got to emphasize the, yeah, yeah, yes, of course, holds that faculty appointments at UC San Francisco School of Medicine and UC Riverside School of Medicine, and he is also the former chancellor at UC Irvine and former Vice President for Health uh, Affairs and holds his, P, his MD from UCSF. Uh, uh, we have just uh, yesterday marked uh, the holiday set aside in the name of Dr. Martin Luther King, who once uh, stated, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. This is what he said about education, the purpose of education. We must remember that intelligence is not enough, he wrote, intelligence plus character. This is the goal of true education with these three leaders of immense intelligence and great character. We will expect great things during tonight's panel discussion and great things for the future character of California higher education. And now let me turn it over, the program, to uh, the campaign's president, Michelle Siqueros, and executive vice president, Jesse Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Munoz. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get started right away, and I'm proud to be co-moderating. We're practicing our, like, co-Oprah skills here. Jesse Ryan, as you all know, is the executive vice president of the Campaign for College Opportunity. Uh, every single victory that we have been able to achieve across the street in Sacramento has been uh, led by Jesse Ryan from transfer reform to the elimination of placement practices to ensuring that we get the kinds of budget allocations and appointments to our higher ed governing bodies that we deserve, so give her a round of applause. She's also been my, my partner in this work for 19 of the 20 years, so next year you get to celebrate your 20th anniversary, uh, Jesse. Um, but I wanna kick it off with uh, Chancellor Christian, uh, and then we'll just go down the, the line here. You heard from three incredible student leaders, advocates, maybe the future three leaders of the community college, Cal State and UC system. Um, Autumn, Carlos, Casey, what did you think? What's your reaction to their uh, remarks? Well, first of all, we just have amazing students, don't we? Let's give it up for them again. Well, before I get to Michelle's question, I just want to share that it's, it's just super exciting to be here with both Michael and Millie. And, uh, you know, representing California's higher education, particularly given national conversations, we're doing things right here in higher education in California. And I see Ben Cheetah out there trying to rally us on the governor's career education master plan. I uh, want to also give a shout out to the Campaign for College Opportunity. I remember starting as president at Bakersfield College in 2013 and got introduced to the campaign by reading the reports. And my first thought was the Campaign for College Opportunity is the conscience of higher education here in California. It's kind of like the uh, John Lewis, right? The conscience of Congress. Um, so this particular report um, that the campaign is focusing on is um, on our employees, our faculty leadership positions, and our students did a phenomenal job um, with, um, with kindness and charisma really calling on us to do even more for the future generation of Californians. So as a proud chancellor of the California Community Colleges, I want to start with recognizing the work that we did 
I see a members of the Board of Governors, Pam Haynes, I see you there, Bill Rawlings, thank you for being here. It, we started our work really on equity focusing in with our students with what we call the vision for success, right? And um, it might seem like the conversation was on the students and not on faculty, presidents, leadership, but I do believe that that really set the stage for the work we are tackling right now. And we're calling on the EEO plans across the community colleges uh, and kind of holding an accountability uh, approach to the work. So the work we did with our students started with data, and that's what the campaign does really well, is putting out the data. And at the California Community Colleges, there were two policy reforms. There was the student-centered funding formula and the goal set forward by the Vision for Success that really disaggregated the data and we were able to recognize that our black students, our Latinx students, and our indigenous students were not meeting the completion numbers like our other students and that started the work, the policy reforms that Michelle talked about. And recently, in the last three years, we, the California Community Colleges, have taken on faculty hiring, we have taken on issues of leadership front and center. We had an investment, thank you governor, thank you the legislature, we had 20 million that was invested for us to move our diversity agenda. So that movement has resulted in significant work, you know, Michelle referred to the work done by uh, Dr. Luke Woods and Frank Harris and we have put out publications, for example, on hiring practices that are jointly supported by all the different constituent groups. I see our Academic Senate President here. Please stand up, Cheryl, and be recognized because our Academic Senate is critical to the work of academia. So when you talk about faculty linking arms with trustees, we are you know, Millie and Michael have a, a single system, but the community colleges have locally governed boards. So when you have trustees of the locally governed boards locking arms with faculties, locking arms with the administrators, and then coming up with a document that talks about what does pre-hiring look like? How do you gear up even prior to the hiring process? What does a hiring process look like if you're truly committed to diversifying our faculty ranks. And what does the post-hiring process look like? You know that we are on the right track. And I'll conclude, Michelle, by bragging about our Board of Governors. We passed regulations recently on DEIA and we have issued guidelines. So when the uh, still left out report came out, uh, Vikash had used data until 2021, right? From 2017 to 2021. And a lot of the work at the community colleges really are in the last three years. So the, the impact we're having is still not captured. So when you put out the report, Vikash, in five years, in 2026, hopefully, I'll still be the chancellor of the California community colleges. And I can guarantee you that those numbers are going to be much, much, much better. Thank wow, you very we much. Got, we got the first pledge. I like it. Let Chancellor me, Garcia. Let me begin by thanking Michelle Campaign for opportunity, for college opportunity, for having me here with my honored colleagues here. They is such a pleasure to be with them. So I think I'm the newest kid on the block here as I come in as the new chancellor. Let me begin by saying that the students were amazing. You are definitely leaders that will go very far. If you want to be the chancellor, you can reach for that or anything else that you would like. Congratulations, because you did do it with elegance, with grace, and with civility. And you could teach everyone how to have those difficult dialogues and still come out to talk and talk about how do we solve these problems together. So thank you very much. Here's what I will say. I spent 12 years of my life as president of Dominguez Hills and at Fullerton. And I went to Washington, D.C. representing 400 regional comprehensive universities in the country. What I will tell you is that us three, this system is the most influential system in the country. 
and that the CSU is also educating the first generation, the low income, the students of color, the adults, the new majority of America that be, makes California, but will happen across the country. So when I came, and it was, I think, 2017, let me just say we have a long way to go. But there's been progress. When I came in, I was the first Latina president to ever be a president at the CSU. Today, they are four. <laughs> women represent 12 women out of 23. Four African-American presidents, three Asian-American Pacific Islander presidents. So that we are, when you add that up together, people of color are the majority presidents of our institutions. And one of the, and some of them are here. Dr. Wood, Dr. Perez, they're here in the audience. Thank you for being here. But well, here's what else I will say to you. That these presidents, and I've read a study done by the personnel, CUPA, what is called the College University Personnel Associations for the Nation, said that when you hire people who are different, the teams that they hire also go up in number. They have the data nationwide. So I am very happy that these presidents are in position. In addition to that, you heard that Dr. Wood and Dr. Harris did this work. Well, all our presidents are knowing about this work because Dr. Wood is now the president of Cal Sacramento State. And so he is sharing that information to the 23 presidents. And finally, I will say we are working very diligently on GI 2025 that we started years ago, even when I was here, and we have made major progress, doubling the graduation rate in four years, increasing our students of color, increasing the number of transfer students to finish in two. We have programs, for example, finish in four on our campuses that are looking and talking to students. We are using data. Some campuses, what they know is, and this is a nationwide data, and students that we serve, that we serve, in their first semester when they're new to a campus, fail one course. 30% of the students fail one course. We have staff, and let's not forget staff. We talked about faculty, we talked about administrators, we talked about staff. But staff also plays an extremely important role in support services, in the turnaround services, in working with faculty. And so when you know that those students, and if you are a first generation student like I was, you're scared to be in college. And when you call those students that failed that one course, and you tell them, look, it's okay, we're here to help you make sure they come back to the next semester, the numbers go up. So the system is really focused on the really having, finishing GI 2025 strong, having a year of engagement where we're sharing promising practices across 23 campuses. We had a made, one of my first things I went to was the GI 2024-25 symposium where you saw teams working together and sharing what was working and what wasn't because we also learned from that. We had a social mobility conference that also talked about social mobility and what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, hearing from students. And then we had a black student success work group. We all know African American numbers of students have gone down in all colleges across all the country. And what they're doing is that we have committed $10 million from the Chancellor's Office to help institutions and have plans on how to ensure that we move the African American population to where they should be. And so we're working hard on that. And then there's another program that we're going after students that left in 2016. 130,000 students left the CSU. We are contacting those students and we are offering them no application fee. We are sitting with them to find out what were the problems, bringing them back and connecting them to our staff and faculty to help them. Our faculty also, when we're looking, and we're going through too much, you cut me off, because I could keep going. <laughs> our, our, fa our faculty is also looking at how do we become proactive recruitment. It's not only putting the ad in the paper, but how do you reach out to HBCUs? How do you reach out to institutions that you know are really graduating people with doctorates for your programs and making those connections? How do we know that? And we are paying attention to retention of students, faculty, and staff. Because, for example, 
I need to know where I'm going to get my hair done because my hair is different from people. And you need to know where you're going to send your children to school. Well, they will be comfortable. You will need to know where you can get your cultural foods so that you can make the foods from your background. All of that is happening on each and every one of our camps in different ways because we have campus from Humboldt all the way down to San Diego. And so, yes, we have a lot to do, but we're going to continue to really force the issue continue to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, use the research that our faculty you do, our staff does, our national organizations do, and ensure that everyone that comes to the CSU feels like they belong, that this is their home, that this is where they want to be. So I'll turn it over to Michael. So great, nice to, uh, to see everyone, and I too would like to congratulate the students who gave a, a, a very uh, thoughtful and measured responses. You, I was a student leader uh, back in the day, and uh, I, oh, my mic's not on. Is that better? I can't remember what I, no, I was saying, I, I appreciated our student leaders who, who came and spoke before us, and. Uh, remember back to the, my uh, student days when I had a chance to come and speak before uh, groups like this from time to time. And I appreciate the focus and the work that it took for you to organize your thoughts and share them with us and to share your experiences. So thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Maybe another round of applause for yes. good. We do appreciate it. And also I was thinking about, and actually a couple of uh, my students are here, uh, Ryan and Celine, just to say hello, nice to see you always, and uh, great to see you with one of my chancellors and one of my bosses. So I have a great group of uh, 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 people here from the family, so nice to see you all. But I was thinking also about um, Sonia and Millie, who I've had a chance to work with now over these last uh, many months, and what difficult jobs you're doing and how much we appreciate that. There was a, an interesting article uh, yesterday, Sunday maybe, in the Washington Post, and it was entitled, Who Would Want to Be a College President Today? Uh, and I don't know how many of you read that article, but um, I read it, and <laughs> I got all the way through the end, but I come, hmm. But actually, many of my friends, I, I happen to have known several of the people who were quoted in the article well, uh, worked with them for many years, and I appreciated hearing their voices, having known them as people, and having them share the challenges that we have in higher education in pushing up against the you know, those forces that resist higher education. Some of them are people who are saying things that they believe and, and, and they want us to change in a variety of ways. Some of them are people who will say things that I believe they don't even believe, uh, that they think that it's politically popular. I, I have told stories of people who I've watched give speeches about how really awful higher education was, and then I'd see them later and they'd say, you know, my daughter's applying. Uh, uh, what can you? What can you do? I wish I weren't telling the truth, but that's an exactly true thing. And so there, there's, a, there's a real challenge there in that dichotomy, but real, a real pushback. And I was thinking just in my uh, three and a half years of being in this role, uh, I'm now the, the senior person in that there have been, well, let me just say that uh, there have been uh, two, three people in each of your roles in just that short period of time. It's, it's that difficult to be successful in these roles. And so I want to give both of my colleagues a real round of applause for the work you're doing <laughs> and the, the dedication and focus that you bring to it to be uh, uh, leaders of um, among the most influential institutions of higher education anywhere in the world and the difference that you're making by your presence and your action and your values and your commitment every day and the differences that you're going to make. And so thank you. Very good uh, to see you. We meet together regularly. We meet together once a month. Um, and um, at the beginning, we begin I think, with kind of a group hug and uh, yeah, how's it going? Uh, but then talk about the various issues that are affecting us locally, regionally, and nationally. And it's great to have a group of colleagues like this to work with. I will say about the diversity and inclusion and expanding, we talked about, talk about the numbers. And I was thinking of a couple of things when I saw the numbers. So two, one was the, when I was at UC Irvine, the percentage of our students that were students of color, uh, uh, black, uh, Native American, Asian, Latino, uh, uh, the, the group of our students who were non-white. And I went from Irvine to Ohio. I went to work at Ohio State. And interestingly, the numbers were the same, 82-18. Uh, Although in California, 82% were non-white and 18% were white. In Ohio, 82% were white and 18% were non-white. So it was a, a stark difference to see 
honestly how things were in this country more broadly, but how things were in California uh, 30, 40 years ago. It was as though we'd I'd gone back 30 or 40 years ago in the inclusion that we were seeing on campuses among, among our students. Now in Ohio, we were there six years. In Ohio in those six years, the numbers of uh, uh, students from minoritized backgrounds doubled. So we were able to go from about 82 and, um, and 18 to more like just over 60% were white and nearly 40% were students of color. So we could see that things could actually change. We had programs that focused on doing that. We watched those programs work. When I think of the University of California numbers, cal numbers at CSU, numbers at our community colleges, what we see is a, a dramatic change in the numbers of students from uh, of students of color on our campuses compared to when, for instance, I went to school or when I was first on the, the faculty. I had a, a, a conversation that I shared with my colleagues a little earlier today. When I was at UC Irvine, I was meeting, I, I arrived as chancellor at UC Irvine in 2005, and I was thinking about this first in, so I was a first in whatever, all the time, you know, just all the first, so I was the first this and that. This is the first um, uh, African-American chancellor for the University of California, so I arrived and I was talking about something in a group of people in Orange County, and actually Orange County, compared to San Francisco where I'd been, had the kind of uh, Irvine, Ohio switch, you know, um, <laughs> that we, we'd seen before. But it was actually a, quite a challenge to go and, and, and be there, but it, uh, uh, we found a welcoming group of supporters, it was great. And I was talking to a person who was talking about her time at UC Berkeley in the 1960s and how really diverse it was and how she appreciated being in a diverse place like that in the 1960s. And I said, well, I don't know if it was all that diverse in the 1960s. And she goes, yes, yes, it was. And, and I didn't want to be argumentative. It was a donor, you know, so I said, I, I, I said, no, that's true, whatever you say. But I had been given a, a, a magazine by a, a wonderful a faculty colleague when I got to Irvine. And it was, I got there in 19, uh, 2005. He, he gave me a Fortune magazine from 2000, from, excuse me, from 1965. So from 40 years before I had been there. And it was about the University of California. It was a story about Clark Kerr and other leaders at the University of California and issues they were dealing with in the mid 1960s with free speech. And it had a picture of Sather Gate at noontime loaded with students going off to class. And I thought after having this conversation, this is exactly true, after this conversation with this woman who assured me of the great diversity when she was a student in the mid 60s, I actually have a photo, let me go and look at the photograph. And I, and I went and looked at the photograph and there were 100-ish students, 150 students identified. I've looked at the photograph many, many times. There's one woman who I believe was Asian, uh, but that was it. I've actually had it printed up and set it on my, uh, uh, my credenza because what it showed is that back then, there really was minuscule representation mm -hmm. of people who were in California and in the country at the time, one here, one there, called diverse. If we look now, if we looked when I was looking in 2005, if we, look, if we took a picture today at Sather Gate at noontime, it would look entirely different than it looked then. And so I see that as being progress that's moved forward. What we see is that to move from that progress in our students to where we are today, to, the, uh, to our graduate students, to our junior faculty, to our tenured faculty, to our leaders. Those things are evolutionary and take time. You have to flow forward. But all of the energy is moving in the right direction. Two things I would say about the, uh, being the first, not being the last, I, uh, 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 proof or proud points. Uh, seven of my uh, people who I've worked with and promoted have gone on to be college presidents at one place or another, so I'm very uh, proud of that. Three of them are African American. So that's the part that I was going to. Uh, uh, to mention, it's been wonderful to, to watch people move up, but, but three of my uh, colleagues who've moved up into these roles are African-American, and, and another mentee um, is uh, Asian-American. So it's great to see that there can be diversity in leadership. What we all have to do together is continue first to open pathways for students to come and join us, That's right. work, uh, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, on programs and like programs that we have to make our students more successful, to have that college experience be more uh, productive and successful, to help them uh, seek positions in graduate education and then in higher education, and to nurture and support them moving forward. We know that there are forces that are pushing back. Mm -hmm. I, I, I taught for many years, of course, in civil rights. Uh, uh, I, I taught undergraduate students until 2020 in the pandemic, but I taught a course in, in civil rights. And I started teaching a course at Irvine as a seminar because I thought, gosh, the young people of today, 18, 19-year-olds, are not going to, they're going to lose touch 
with the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s and the effort that people had to put into changing things to allow us to be diverse, as I mentioned that we were then, and allow the diversity to continue to grow. And I taught this as history, uh, sharing things that happened in the 1960s and, and before that I thought the 18 and 19 year olds of the day wouldn't really believe. How could people behave in such a narrow-minded and, uh, and hostile fashion? Sadly, in the years that I was teaching the course, we went from history to current events. And we were able to use current events mm -hmm. from the newspaper to illustrate the same points that I had had to go back 30 and 40 years to find um, uh, it, it, when we began teaching the course. And it reminds me that we have to keep both feet on the accelerators and have to continue to link arms and to push forward to continue to make the opportunities that we uh, need for our country and for our world the opportunities of the future. Let me, right. oh, well, let me finish one, let me finish and say that uh, yesterday, one of the things I hope that many of you were able to do, and I know always, I'm always able to do on Martin Luther King Day is listen to some of Dr. King's speeches yeah. or watch them as he um, uh, delivered them such that the words are beautiful and poetic and thoughtful uh, to read. His delivery is passionate and mm -hmm. emotional and, and captivating. I mean, it was incredible. What an incredible person uh, that was really, and how here we are listening now 60 years later to the work that he looked in, focusing on the work that he was doing 60 years ago. Great that he was inspiring, great that those messages are still there. Sad in many ways that they're still so mm -hmm. relevant, but a message for us all to keep on going so that many years from now, we can all look at the progress that's occurred under our watch and under our lifetimes as well. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Michelle, for the work you've been doing for 20 years, and I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, President Drake. I just wanted to, uh, I, Michael reminded me of something that I know we have to do a better job in, is how do we do professional development for all that we want? So that is extremely important. It's one of the things I learned in Washington, D.C., right? I had a wonderful mentor when I was younger and a faculty member that got up and said, how many of us get up and tell people being a professor is the best job in the world and tell our students that, that this mm. is an option for them and help them get through that. We now have programs for that, but nearly not enough. How many do we tell, to, this is the pathway you do to be a, a dean, a staff member, a vice president, a president? You know, what I've learned from ASCU, where they have a program called the Millennial Leadership Institute, there we are, we have a graduate, right, Juan Munoz, President, Juan Munoz, Chancellor Juan Munoz is in front of us. That program started in 1999 to diversify the presidency. When you look at the numbers, yes. 175 people have been in presidents, and there are two people have been in their second and third presidency, like P Chancellor Munoz. Those are the kinds of programs that we have to start looking at. Looking at how to do the Emerging Leaders Co Program, becoming a provost, becoming a dean to work with faculty. We don't do enough of that yeah. where other professions do. Chancellor Garcia, I want to come back to the work that remains. And But first, I, I want to thank President Drake for such a powerful both story and visual that you're providing us. And I want to touch upon something you said, which is the reality of the counter forces, right? We know right now that nationally we are seeing attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion at an alarming rate. This was evidenced by the Supreme Court decision banning race-conscious admissions. And as you know, the campaign took up and launched a coordinated response to ensure that we were addressing what we heard from our students today, the need to counter the chilling effect and to provide our students and family with a message that they belong, that they are welcome in higher education. And so I want to ask our system leaders, in the face of these attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion, what are you doing at the system level that you believe is transformational? And let's be honest, what work remains to be able to ensure that our campuses at every level reflect the diversity of the state? And I'm going to start with Sonia, actually. Sonia, go ahead. She said Sonia. Yeah. All right. That's me. So um, you know, when, when you think about challenges and barriers when it comes to DEIA work, specifically related to the report put out by the campaign on 
that's still left out. To me, the issue is just one simple issue, and that is the mindset and approach that has been very much part of the academic culture for a long time. It's not something that happened you know, in the last few years. It's sort of a legacy bias that perpetuates. Mm -hmm. It is about you know, hiring more of the same, right? Hiring more of the same. So to be able to tackle issues that are so deeply rooted, the in crowd and then the out crowd, it takes a lot of effort, systematic effort, and a comprehensive set of strategies all happening at the same time, and it's not you know, one and done. Mm -hmm. So at the California Community Colleges, we have been tackling it from, you know, I had mentioned in my opening remarks, with the Board of Governors taking on regulatory changes in various aspects uh, related to student outcomes, and I talked about it, but specifically related to the report talking about hiring practices. That is huge for Board of Governors to really take on sort of a regulatory change, so we put that in, in place. We're also tackling some of our system issues to make, uh, make changes. But where we are focusing our effort right now is a lot on the practice because to permeate into the campus communities, you know, a lot of influential individuals reside at the department chair level, at the dean level. When you're talking about hiring adjunct faculty, who gets to make the decision, right? So when, when you're thinking about this in-group bias that Daniel Kahneman talks about, or talking about confirmation bias, it is professional development, it is continuously from all levels having the conversations that is really going to, to make the change happen. I loved that both Michael and, and Jesse, you pointed out the changing tides nationally because what I'm reminded as I'm getting older that <laughs> hard-won victories that we have seen, you know, in my lifetime, I see a lot of those that we are losing them. So it is the, the call to be vigilant and the call to be constantly pushing the envelope and pushing the, um, the work at all levels become important. What is so fortunate in the California Community Colleges, I've only been chancellor for eight months. Well, Millie is actually the baby. Um, <laughs> Uh, so even though I've been only for eight months, what I've realized is what, is what has happened within the community colleges is that all constituent groups, and I mentioned this, and I can't emphasize how important it is, all constituent groups have signed on to the same document. And that, if that hadn't happened, my level of optimism would not be what it is today. And I said, you know, in five years, we will see a, a difference in the California Community Colleges. I mean, faculty coming to the table, right? Disciplined faculty, when you're talking about tenure process, tenure happens at the discipline level, not really at the college level. So as, you know, we as systems leads, we need to set the expectation, presidents need to set the expectation, and to penetrate the practice level, it really requires us to, to kind of shift the mindset in such a fundamental way that the next generation coming through is going to approach the selection and the concept of quality. How many times have we heard in hiring processes, oh, we cannot uh, get the quality down. The standards cannot be diminished. Those are all false arguments, right? Those are false arguments because the data, we need to focus on what the data shows like the still left out report. So even though in the face of all the turbulence that's happening nationally and the pressures, I mean, certainly the community colleges, you know, we are having a lot of distractions and a lot of pressures, but we are doubling down on our efforts and moving at the campus level, at the department chair level, and at the faculty level in the classrooms to have this change happen. Thank you. So being the baby and being here for months, I bring a different perspective. While we're talking about the challenges nationwide, we are so blessed to be in California. Mm. 
sitting there with 400 presidents telling me what's happening in Georgia, what's happening in Florida, what's happening in all of these states. We have a governor and a legislature that believe in DEI. Let's be clear. I have a board of trustees that holds presidents accountable for student success, for faculty success. You have presidents that are holding their people accountable. And it's true, faculty appoint faculty. But the question is, if you got four lines, how diverse was the pool? Why didn't there be, well, why weren't there be more people? Questioning and letting people know this is a priority for us and make sure that we continue to do that. I've talked about the many programs in the CSU. We are committed. I've done triennial uh, presidencies, my fir two first ones. I will be quiet about who they are. Uh -huh. But what I did ask was, let's look at your students' disaggregated data. How are the students doing? Where are they failing? What courses are they failing? What are we doing about it? What is our support network? We have to remember belonging. Students come not understanding our campuses. We have to look at belonging. What are you doing about your staff, your senior team? What does it look, and asking the questions and holding people accountable. We have to be real. There are some disciplines we don't have enough people of color in those disciplines. You know them better than I do, but they are there. And so what we have to do is a consistent, intentional plan as a system Letting my president, 23 presidents know, and they know that we're on it, that we are into DEI for every level of our institution and our stakeholders. And then also working with our communities because we are stewards of place. And we talk to those families and their children in their language and in their space to talk about the value. We need to talk about a return on investment. We need to use our alumni that look like them. We heard about that. Our faculty that look like them. Talk about why a college degree is so important. Mm -hmm. And then we have to go to the workforce. I just met someone from Boeing and I said, yes, Boeing and I, Boeing, you and I, we should do an op-ed to talk about the value of higher ed because it's about the workforce. Because if we don't educate the new majority of America, our communities will hurt, our state will hurt, our economic independence as a state and as a nation will hurt. It is an intentional, consistent plan. So several things. First, appreciate again your, your comments. And one of the nice things we have in California really derives back again to the 1960s when we made a plan to work together with the community colleges, the state university system, and the University of California to sort of look at higher education and cooperate and focus on different aspects of uh, the higher education system so that a kid in, in, uh, in high school, a kid uh, in, in grade school can say, gosh, there's a pathway for me forward, and all the pathways are connected. There's no limit. Once I enter this system, there's no ceiling. It really, the sky is the limit as we work uh, to move forward. And one of the things that we continually look for is to do everything we can to make transfer as smooth and seamless as possible. We're pleased and proud of that. It's a critical, a critical part of our future. How many people in the audience here were transfer students? Uh, like, like I was, so, 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 so many of us. <clears throat> and a really, really important uh, pathway forward. And then we want to do what we can working with uh, all of our colleagues and, and uh, particularly our CSU colleagues and helping to bring more people into graduate school and developing that professoriate for the future. So it's a, a, a really connected uh, opportunity for our, our California citizens to do what they can to lift and, and move things forward. And then it's important, I, I would say, I, I mentioned this before and I've been thinking about it a lot, we are working to have the, an, an inclusive and uh, culturally sensitive and experienced and outstanding group of leaders on our campuses. And I'll think I'll, I'll pick on Chancho Munoz who's here with, um, uh, with us today. So important, I mentioned these, uh, Chancho Munoz has one of these hard jobs. Uh, and what's really important is that we support Chancellor Munoz in doing the work that we know he wants to do. So for our board, for our broad con communities, et cetera, we know that we want to support uh, our leaders who are trying to do the things that we want to do and to move forward. It's a funny thing that happens. Uh, a conversation with colleagues a few years ago, um, if I get mildly personal, uh, yeah, a few years ago we were, one of the colleagues was the uh, uh, president of uh, one of our unnamed universities uh, uh, someplace in the middle part of the country. And he was talking about programs that they had 
for African American intellectuals and saying, boy, you know what, that's, that's a real, it's something, something first rank African American intellectuals and what a rarity uh, 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 that was, how hard it was to do that. This was quoted in the New York Times, so I'm not making this up. Uh, so, and, and, and how, what, a, what a difficult thing it was to do. Boy, what a, what a unicorn that was to find such a thing. And, and it was somebody who I knew. Uh, and so somebody mentioned, well, what about people like, well, me? And <coughs> I mean, actually, this story mentioned me by name. And he said, oh, I don't mean people like, of course, you know, Michael's fine, you know, but I mean, what about the others of them? And this thing that happens is that when you uh, achieve a certain position, I'm going to again pick on Chancellor Munoz, people decide that you then aren't who you are and that you're not connected anymore to who you actually are and who you were and are not doing the work. Yeah. Well. I appreciate that because that's something people don't, don't say much, yeah. I'll say. And, and then they start isolating and cutting you off from your own people to try to push you to the side. And really what we have to do is to, when we have people that have come up through all of this and get to positions of being supportive and, and have some influence on what's happening, knowing that they are, they are connected to us and knowing that we have to work with them to allow them to do their, their good work. So a really important thing for us, again, to do as a community to help support people like my colleagues and like Chancellor Munoz in moving things forward because it's hard enough anyway, it's hard enough with the repressive forces that we see on display. You can go home tonight and turn on the TV and you'll see them yeah. on display tonight. Um, and they're not resting, you know, they're not, uh, they're, they're, they'll, be, they'll wake up tomorrow with this and, and push back. We have to make sure we keep our energy, that we support ourselves, that we don't, we, we're not kicking our own dog, you know, that we're supporting ourselves and moving things forward. And I think that that's the way to go forward. I have one more tiny thing to say. And that is that, you know, journey of a thousand miles begins with a, a single step. I mean, the work of moving to where we want to, the sustainable work that we need to do to change the future is step by step work. It's like in the football analogy, it's blocking and tackling every day, doing the work it needs to continue to move forward and never taking our eye off the prize. I love it. So we, we had about 50 questions that we narrowed down to seven questions, and I've been told we have less than five minutes. So these last two questions, we're gonna ask you to um, do rapid fire answer on them. And um, you know, Sonia, Millie, you both made history as the first uh, women to lead the biggest community college and the biggest Cal State University system. We've talked a lot about that. Um, the question I have for you is, what are the challenges that you face? You know, both the CSU and the community college system um, have almost e have equity in terms of college leadership presidents. The University of California only has two women as chancellors of the nine campuses. And we have a UC regent here that um, is also on our board, Maria Anguiano. Raise your hand so people can talk to you afterwards too, Maria. <laughs> I want you to share what are some of the challenges um, that you have faced that you, you know, in a room of folks that can help you with those challenges, and what sage advice do you have for the University of California's Board of Regents to ensure they actually hire more women as chancellors uh, of campuses? And rapid fire, because, you know, <laughs> Jesse has another question for you. I would tell the UC Regents, do what the Board of Governors did for the California Community Colleges. Uh, you asked two things, so I'm gonna go, I wanna go to that one first. I think we have to really look at what a person has done rather than where they have been to school and how many publications they have. We are looking for people who can do the work. And yes, there are certain criteria that are essential, but if you read Estela Ben Simon's work mm -hmm. on how to hire presidents, I think the UC could also read that report as well. So that's what I would say, because she lists right there all the unconscious bias that goes on. I mean, I have. I have been on search committees and they say, that woman didn't dress like a president, and I had to raise my hand because I was the only one there. So I think those are the kinds of things that we have to be very conscious of, and regions like Board of Trustees should get some training as well on unconscious bias and diversity and how to look at things. Uh, what I would say is, 
we have been, I want to say for myself, I think I have been through what our students have been through, what any woman of color and woman, we, mm. we are seen as women, we are seen as people of color, we are seen by many that we don't belong. And so we have to just continue to push the door, be bold, be energetic, be optimistic, and be good at what you do. Because you get really, I think women and people of color in particular, as I watch what's going on, I used to do research on this, as I watch what's going on across the country. If a president loses his job as a person of color, it's harder for that person to pick themselves up and go on, not for the others. President Drake, challenges and opportunities. Well, I think the challenges are the challenges that we know, but the opportunities are on the other flip side of that. I think we have uh, wonderful people who are in our system, wonderful people coming up. We are doing searches now. We all are uh, doing searches, and we use equity advisors now on all the searches to make sure we have a diverse and inclusive pool, and then we work hard to pick the best person as we move things forward. But it's, uh, again, it's, as I said, it's everyday work. Uh, uh, blocking and tackling to continue moving forward and uh, we'll keep linking arms and continue to do that. I want to just also, I didn't do this, I want to sh make sure to shout out to our legislature and governor as well. We really, I was in the state, well never, never mind, uh, I would, don't, don't speak in any other places, I'll say that our uh, governor is particularly focused on higher education and it makes a real difference. Our legislature is filled with members who are really focused on higher education. It makes a real, real difference and with that broad support we have a chance to continue to progress. That's great. That's wonderful. So you've, you've talked a lot about the importance of being the first, and I've been reflecting today on the fact that my earliest childhood memory was being a five-year-old right across the street at the state capitol and having my mother, who was a low-income, uh, struggling, single welfare mom, take me to see Geraldine Ferraro speak. And she pointed at Geraldine Ferraro and said, if she can run for Vice President Jesse, you can be anything you want in the world. So I wanna thank you all for being the first because I know that you are inspiring girls and boys everywhere to be leaders of systems and leaders that are changing these dynamics and still left out. And you deserve a round of applause as trailblazers. With that, you are leading through extraordinarily challenging times. And so I want to ask you a last question that's a hard question that I hope you'll answer honestly and courageously and with a focus on racial equity. What do you hope your leadership legacy will be? And I'll start with Sonia. I don't know if all of you have heard about Vision 2030, okay? If you have not heard about it, it's a plan that has been approved by the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges. And simply put, what that plan, that vision is trying to accomplish is to find those. It is not to wait as college for folks to find us, okay? If we truly, if we are truly committed to the equity agenda, the answer is in those people who have not found us, those who are left out. So using still left out to our student population and those who are not in our student population, Vision 2030 really hopes to get to those individuals and bring them into higher education because we believe that higher education is the single answer, it is the single answer to the diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility agenda. And if those individuals haven't found us, that transformation is never going to happen. So it is, a, it's, it is high stakes, it is high stakes. We're calling out low income, 6.8 million Californians who don't have a credential and are stuck in low income jobs. So it is finding those who are left out and taking it on as our moral obligation to bring college to them, to envelop them in all the support they need and get them to that first college credential, to that job and to a life that they can live, a well lived life that every Californian has a right to. So that's the hope 
for, for Vision 2030, which is going to be my work as the Chancellor of the California Community Colleges. I think you hear that for all of us, this is personal. It's a commitment. It is something we're doing because we really believe, and I'm gonna say my legacy is that I honor my parents who taught us that the only inheritance a poor family could leave you is a good education. And I am living that inheritance today. And what I want for the CSU is that, that everybody that walks in through our door and those in our community that want to come to us or transfer from the community college or, and then move on to the UC, reach their highest potential. That they are the, if you look at California, we are the most diverse state, the fourth largest economy in this state, that they go into careers that lifts this state to be the best state in the nation, and that those individuals become educated citizens committed to economic and social uh, in independence, diversity, equity, inclusion, and become engaged citizens in a democracy. That's what I want for everyone that is coming to the CSU and then connects with my two colleagues that we all three of us work so well together. I think a couple of things occur. One is that we are inclusive, but we can be more inclusive. We can be better. Another is that we are excellent, but we can be more excellent. We can be better. And that we can be inclusive and excellent at the same time, that those two support each other. And to be the best, we have to be both inclusive and excellent at the same time. And we can do that over and over again. And then the, the uh, final thing I would say, at the end of the day, I want people to be able to look at what we've all done together and to realize that we shall overcome. Well, clearly, um, we certainly got inclusive excellence among us today with the three of you in your leadership roles. So join me in giving them a big round of applause. I feel like we could keep talking, um, but we are going to allow some time for you to mingle. Just so honored to live in this state with your energy and leadership in the best public university and community college system in the country and certainly in the world. Um, with that, I want to thank um, the three of you again, and Jesse for my co-host uh, moderating uh, partner, and invite another one of our board of directors, Thomas Sines, the president and general counsel of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund to close us out. And I'd like to ask my board of directors that are here, the campaign has been successful because we are guided by passionate, excellent, inclusive individuals, Dr. Luke Wood, Dr. Ed Bush, Maria Anguiano, and Chancellor Munoz. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Michelle. I first want to thank all of you for being here. Your being here recognizes the critical importance over two decades of the Campaign for College Opportunity, but more important, anticipates the role that the campaign will play in the future of higher education, not just here in California, but across the country. So thank you all for being here. I also want to be sure and thank our sponsors for their support of this important event in California's state capital. I want again to thank our speakers, our three system leaders, inspiring in all of their remarks. This is obviously something that is at the core of their leadership and central to their positive legacies that each of them will leave. And I, of course, once more want to thank our extraordinary student leaders who have inspired all of us to understand even more deeply the work that we do together with those young leaders for the future of California. I also, of course, want to recognize that beyond our two star Oprahs, Michelle and Jesse, the campaign staff is a set of incredibly talented and committed individuals. And I want to ask each of the staff members to stand or wave your hand so we can thank you, not just for this tremendous program, but for this tremendous report.
finally, I want to ask you all to support the campaign for college opportunity in its next 20 years. The campaign needs your support, and you can join our network or donate through the QR codes that are on the screen. But this is important work. And I would say it's particularly important today because after 20 years of the campaign's existence, after what happened six and a half months ago in Washington, D.C., when the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the 45-year-old precedent set challenging a medical school just down the road from here in the Bakke case, that California is once again called obliged to lead the nation. And our leadership stems not just from the fact that 28 years ago, voters in this state imposed restrictions, not just on affirmative action in admissions, but on hiring and on contracting at every one of our systems. And we have had, over those 28 years, have had to work harder, to dream bigger, to achieve what we have achieved so far with respect to representation at these universities. But as we mourned, and I have joined everyone in mourning, the loss of the Baki decision that at least permitted limited consideration of race and gender in the admissions process, at the same time we should recognize, I believe, that the decision issued in Harvard and UNC cases establishes a new destination for us all. That is to say, diversity is no longer our primary destination. As a lawyer, I can tell you that for 45 years, we have been stuck in a Supreme Court created, particularly created by Justice Lewis Powell, no great liberal for those who remember, but by his rejection of equity, or specifically the elimination of the effects of ongoing discrimination, rejecting that as an acceptable purpose for our efforts in higher education admissions and confining us solely to diversity as a rationale to support those efforts to address the exclusion of too many in our society. I submit that after that decision six and a half months ago, our destination must change from diversity to equity. Now the beauty of that new destination is that when we achieve equity, we will of necessity have achieved diversity. The opposite is not true. We can get to diversity without equity at all. There are some across the country who would assert that California has already achieved diversity and that the numbers that were on the screen show it. But there is no question in this room, I hope, or beyond that we are still far distant from equity. Now the importance of this new destination is that it will require a recalibration. But the report that you got today fresh off the printing press, still left out, is a report that is consciously grounded in equity. The comparison of those who are administrating to those who are students is a measure, one measure, of equity. And the underrepresentation gap is the prime representation of equity. And I can tell you that I believe in my heart and in my core that as we lead the nation in changing our destination, our prime destination from, de from diversity to equity, the GPS that's going to recalibrate our navigated journey is the campaign for college opportunity. And I can think of no better investment for all of us in the GPS that will guide us to that new critically important and achievable destination of equity in higher education. 
thank you all. We invite you to stay and continue to network, continue to enjoy refreshments, and certainly take some time before you leave to find some way of supporting our GPS, the campaign for college opportunity. Good night.